Illinois University. First, an acknowledgement, Northern Illinois University operates and is built on the traditional lands of the Sioux, Miami, Potawatomi, Sauk, and Peoria peoples. We seek to acknowledge this land and these peoples in order to honor the legacies, struggles, and current existence of indigenous people and begin the work of learning and fulfilling our obligations for those of us who are uninvited guests on indigenous lands. And now I would like to thank the Council on Library and Information Resources, or CLEAR, without which this project and symposium would not have been possible. The symposium marks the conclusion of the Johansson Project, which was made possible by a digitizing hidden collections grant from CLEAR and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I'm especially proud to welcome you to this symposium because I have seen all the hard work that went into not just this symposium, but also the digitization, cataloging, and development of lesson plans as part of the project. The symposium, of course, was made more complicated by the pandemic, and I want to offer kudos to everyone involved with planning it at both NIU and Villanova. The CLEAR grant fit very well into our library's natural priorities of making these and other primary resources more widely available, not only through digitization, but also by finding innovative ways for instructors to incorporate them into their courses. Much as they did in the past, these materials themselves draw the reader in with their fantastical cover images and titles, and also provide modern researchers and students with a unique lens through which to view the time period. From what has been called the first US science fiction novel in the steam man of the prairies, to the explorations of identity in, in titles such as The Red Butterfly and Deadwood Dick, these stories and the hundreds of others like them help us to answer questions about the times in which they were written, and also to think about our current times as well. Moreover, we know that students learn more when they are able to use primary resources to think critically about the past, rather than simply taking notes in a lecture hall or reading a textbook. I know that even after the fulfillment of this grant, our library and all of you in this symposium will continue with this important work. So now I just want to say a few words of gratitude. In addition to CLEAR, I want to thank project manager Sata Prescott, catalogers Christian Lash, Pat Arney, and Elizabeth Fenwick, Angie Schroeder and Sarah Kane of the Rare Books and Special Collections, Barbara Witzel in Sponsored Programs Administration, and our partners at Villanova University, especially Damien Katz, Taylor Prihar Rials, and Michael Foyt, and Dr. Melissa Adams Campbell in the Department of English. And last but not least, I want to thank Professor My uh, Matthew Short of the NIU, NIU Libraries for all of the work he has put into this project from its conception. It would be very difficult for me to find a portion of the grant, the project and the symposium that he did not somehow influence and drive. Kudos to you, Matt, for all of your hard work. And now without further ado, I would like to hand it off to Matt. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, so my name is Matthew Short and I'm the digital collections and metadata librarian here at NIU and also the principal investigator on the Johansson project. Uh, as Fred just mentioned, this symposium is the culmination of around four or five years of work to digitize the dime novels of Beetle and Adams, which are primarily held in NIU's Johansson collection. Nearly 6,500 volumes have been made available on our site, Nickels and Dimes, where they can be freely viewed and downloaded as PDFs. The grant also enabled us to partner with Villanova University to create a comprehensive bibliographic database about the collection, which traces every edition and also seeks to impact complex authorial identities. We're very fortunate to have 12 dime novel scholars participating tonight and tomorrow in this symposium. Each of them has drafted a spotlight on particular dime novels from the collection. These contain contextual information about the novel, biographical information about the author, discussion questions, and an annotated bibliography. Over the next month, participants will also record brief lectures to be paired with their spotlights, which will be posted on nickels and dimes and made available for streaming on YouTube. We have 21 spotlights available already, including several written by NIU faculty and graduate students. Our hope is that these will provide an entry point to the collection and might someday find their way into a classroom. If you'd be interested in contributing a spotlight of your own, please get in touch with me. So for the next 20 minutes or so, we'll be showing a few videos which are available on a playlist on YouTube already. We pre-recorded these in hopes that at least a few may be reusable in other contexts like in the classroom. After the videos, we plan to move into a discussion with five panelists about teaching with dime novels, followed by at least 20 minutes of Q&A. Feel free to drop any questions you have into the chat, or you can use the raise hand function when the time comes to ask your question. Until then, please turn off your camera and keep yourselves muted. <clears throat> so without further ado, I will try to stream some videos.
All right, here it goes. Are you having uh, technical difficulties, Matt? Oh, can you can you not hear it? No, uh, we're just getting uh, a window on your desktop. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> uh, I'll try sharing the screen instead. And jump in if you can't see it. Oh, wait, did I need success led to imitation by other publishers? My name is Matthew Short. Are you able to hear and see? Collections and metadata library at Northern Illinois. Yes, uh, but can you full screen it? Yeah, yeah. And the principal investigator on the Johansson Project and the Street and Smith Project. Dime novels were one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the United States in the later half of the 19th century. This brief talk provides a working definition of the format and looks more closely at who wrote, published, and read these novels and why we should care about them today. In June 1860, Beadle and Adams published Melisca, the Indian Wife of the White Hunter by Mrs. Anna Stevens. This novel is the first in a series titled Beadle's Dime Novels, which ran for over 600 issues. Each number in the series contains a short novella, usually around 100 pages, which was sewn bound as a small booklet under distinctive orange paper covers. The stories were primarily frontier or historical romances, much of them written in imitation of James Fenimore Cooper. While most hardback fiction at the time might cost a dollar or more, equal to a laborer's wages for 12 hours of work, dime novels could be purchased for only 10 cents. The series was enormously successful, with each issue selling between 40 and 60,000 copies. A few issues of the series, such as Seth Jones, even sold in the hundreds of thousands, which was as good or better than most of the best-selling novels of the day. Success led to imitation by other publishers, and then the evolution of the format. What most people called dime novels were really the dime libraries or nickel weeklies, which began to appear a decade later in the mid-1870s. The earliest of these were also published by Beadle, including Beadle's New York Dime Library and Beadle's Half Dime Library. Like the dime novels before Mike them, off. the dime libraries were mainly marketed off. to adults and often dealt with more adult topics and themes. The nickel libraries, however, were aimed at children, and especially boys between the ages of 8 and 16, who could spare a nickel more easily than they could spare a dime. The libraries are sometimes known by collectors as black and whites because they have illustrated black and white first pages and no wrappers. They vary in size from octavo to quarto, containing as few as 16 pages and as many as 64. Each library consists of one novella of around 20,000 words, but they sometimes also contain backup features like short stories or parts of serialized stories. By issuing their novels in a series with the occasional backup features, publishers sought to qualify for the lower second class postage rate for periodicals, which was the real reason that publishers were able to sell dollar novels for a dime. The next major innovation was the Nickel Weekly, the earliest of which contained just 16 pages before 32 pages became the standard. Unlike the libraries, these novels had full color wrappers, beginning with the first issue of Tip Top Weekly in 1890. Backup features also became much more common as dime novel publishers struggled to keep ahead of changing postal regulations. The post office was facing a huge deficit at the turn of the century and had been trying to reclassify dime novels as first class mail for decades. They would eventually succeed in 1909 when Tip Top Weekly was reclassified as a book, which was one of the main contributing factors to the demise of the format. The final evolution of the dime novel is the thick book, which actually has much more in common with paperback novels, containing between 100 and 300 pages. While sometimes featuring original stories, more often these would be collections of previously published works. 
as many as three or four weeklies would be combined into a single thick book and presented as a new novel through the addition of connecting chapters. Street and Smith were the most prolific thick book publisher, issuing series like the Merriwell Library until 1933. No discussion of the dime novel would be complete without also mentioning story papers. These were newspapers that contained no news, but instead serialized stories, short stories, poetry, and editorial features. While the story paper originated in the 1830s, well before the dime novel, they were issued by the same publishers and often contained identical contents. Most of the early dime novels, libraries, and weeklies were simply reprints of stories that had been previously serialized in the story papers. Publishers would continue to rely on the contents of story papers to fill the back pages of their weeklies until the end of the dime novel era. The format was also extremely popular and would continue to be issued alongside the dime novel well into the 1910s and 1920s. So to review, the term dime novel encompasses many formats, beginning with the original pamphlets issued by Beadle and Adams in 1860, moving to the black and white libraries of the 70s and 80s, and then the color weeklies between 1890 and 1915. Finally, thick books close out the era, running until 1933. While there were many factors that contributed to the format's decline, the final nail in the coffin was film. For less than a dime, boys could see the same adventures they read about in dime novels acted out on the screen. But many dime novel series, characters, and authors would continue on into film, radio, pulp magazines, and even comic books. Separately are the story papers, which are closely intertwined with the dime novel, but have their own complicated history. There were dozens of publishers who put out dime novels, but only five who published them in significant quantities for any length of time. First is Beadle and Adams, who again are credited with originating the format. Although Erasmus Beadle founded the business, the consensus today is that Irwin deserves most of the credit for the dime novel itself. Unfortunately, Erasmus didn't agree and with his business partner Robert Adams, forced his brother out of the firm. Beadle and Adams are also the subject of developer Johansson's bibliography, which provides a comprehensive history of the publisher. Next is George Monroe, a former employee of Beadle, who split off with Irwin to form a rival company in 1863. George would publish Monroe's Tencent novels, An Imitation of Beetle, and The Fireside Companion, a story paper that introduced Old Sleuth, one of the dime novel's most popular characters. His longest running series was The Seaside Library, which primarily reprinted English and American novels and romance fiction. George's brother Norman also got into the dime novel publishing business and had a bad habit of stealing his brother's ideas. To his credit, though, he was one of the most tireless and effective advertisers and self promoters of the 19th century. While other publishers were playing up the high moral tone of their offerings, Norman was proudly advertising that his story paper printed only the spiciest tales of divorce and sex. Perhaps his greatest claim to fame is the series Old Cap Collier Library, which is the first periodical dedicated entirely to detective fiction. Norman entered into partnership with Frank Tausey in 1873, who split off to form his own rival company three years later. Tausey would end up outdoing many other publishers when it came to printing sensational subject matter, was the first to target young boys specifically with his series Boys of New York. This paper featured the exploits of inventors Frank Reed and Jack Wright, who are some of the earliest science fiction heroes. And finally, there's Street and Smith, who was the only publisher to survive the dime novel era, transitioning into pulp magazines and comics. They survived in part by buying up the rights to all of their former competitors and incorporating them into their own series. That said, Street and Smith were hugely successful in their own right, responsible for publishing stories about arguably the most popular characters in 19th century American fiction. The detective Nick Carter, the heroes of track and field Frank and Dick Merriwell, and the frontiersman Buffalo Bill. The publishing of cheap fiction was sometimes an ugly business. When the Monroe brothers weren't busy suing one another, they were busy suing Beadle, Tausey, or Street and Smith. In fact, the stories about the disagreements between the five publishers are at least as entertaining as the novels they published, involving the same proportion of family drama and betrayal. So who wrote dime novels? Prior to the 1850s, most popular fiction in the United States was pirated from Europe. The mysteries of Eugene Sue were probably the most popular, as is the work of Charles Dickens. Dime novel publishers would continue to reprint English and French novels well into the 20th century. This was extremely lucrative because there were no international copyright laws, so the only costs were for printing, binding, and distribution. The 1850s saw the rise of the first literary celebrities, figures like Eden Southworth, Sylvanus Cobb, and Meta Victor. These were mostly the invention of Robert Bonner, publisher of the New York Ledger, arguably the most successful story paper of all time, who realized that he could market a story based on name recognition alone. He would offer exclusive contracts in exchange for generous salaries and even benefits like paid time off. Some of the earliest dime novels, including the first by Mrs. Anna Stevens, were written by celebrated authors. 
When contracts began to expire, competition to sign away a rival publisher's authors drove up cost. This was good for the authors, but often less good for the publisher. They started to realize it would be better if the author was their sole property. This trend really began with Old Sleuth, a name used by creator Harlan Page Halsey for his famous detective hero of the same name in stories that were published by George Monroe. When brother Norman Monroe introduced a very similar character named Young Sleuth, George sued and won. Even when Street and Smith lured Halsey away, George sued again and the courts found that he had a certain property right in the use of the phrase sleuth under the trademark laws, which uh, didn't go with its creator to a rival publisher. After this, dime novels were seldom attributed to real-world people, but instead to house names that would be owned by the publisher. Although the popular conception is that dime novels are only read by children, we know that in the beginning they were popular with all readers, young and old, wealthy and poor, male and female. Reflecting this diversity, publishers would often refer to their readers as the unknown public, the great people, and the million. The widespread popularity of the format has been attributed to a number of factors, like rising literacy rates, printing press improvements, and better distribution via the railroads. But it also has a lot to do with the fact that dime novels were cheap, certainly much cheaper than most of the fiction that was available before the Civil War. By the 1870s, publishers began to target particular audiences as their marketing tactics evolved. For example, there were romance series like Beatles Fireside Library, which were aimed primarily at young women. But some of these efforts were more successful than others, with the general readership beginning to shift dramatically towards the end of the century. Publishers would focus most of their efforts on adolescent boys, with series about cowboys, detectives, inventors, and sports heroes making up the vast majority of what was published. Series for adults and girls still existed, like My Queen, but were not as common. Like most forms of popular entertainment consumed by children, dime novels were often the subject of controversy and a target for reformers and critics, most notably Anthony Comstock. Comstock was a United States Postal Inspector and longtime secretary of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. In his Traps for the Young, published in 1883, he argues that dime novels and story papers lead to crime as adolescent readers act out the behaviors they see modeled in the stories they read. You can see an illustration of this argument in the book's frontispiece, which shows boys buying story papers like Satan's Snare, then committing acts of vandalism and violence. Comstock would famously send Frank Tausey to the tombs for publishing Eugene Sue novel, arrest numerous news dealers, and reportedly burn thousands of dime novels and story papers in his moral crusade. While this campaign against the dime novels is short-lived, it did influence the public's perception of the format. Dime novel became a pejorative term and one associated primarily with books for undiscriminating and often wayward children. At any rate, it's primarily because dime novels were read by such a wide range of people that we're still interested in them today. While they may be lacking in substance and style, studying the format provides insight into what a diverse group of Americans were thinking and feeling at the end of the 19th century. Perhaps at the top of this list of topics is race and ethnicity. Our opinions on these subjects have thankfully evolved since the dime novel era, but the dime novel is one place for social and cultural historians to study this evolution. Dime novels are more racially diverse than most people expect, with Native American, Black, and Chinese characters appearing most frequently. These depictions are seldom very positive, although that doesn't mean they're not complex. And one thing that surprises students is how often ethnic minorities like Italians and Irish are also the target of exploitation and ridicule. Dime novels are also fertile grounds for understanding popular conceptions of gender and sexuality. Western heroes like Denver Doll and Calamity Jane broke long-established gender norms, not only in their appearance, but in their behavior. They resisted marriage, operated their own businesses, solved crimes, and fought alongside their male companions. Many researchers have been interested in trying to understand what that means in the larger context of American literature and culture, and especially in the context of the Western genre. Detective fiction is also full of gender transgressions, especially through the use of disguise and secret identities. Nick Carter seems to face off with a new femme fatale in every other issue, including pirate queens, Amazon queens, hobo queens, as well as thieves and even serial killers. While far from being positive depictions, these villains often have more agencies than the damsels usually do. Another common archetype is the dude or sport, like Violet Vane and Disco Dan, who are featured in a number of novels as recurring characters. These are impeccably well-dressed men who usually travel together in pairs and are rarely married until the conclusion of their adventures. The subtext in these stories is hardly very subtle. While we haven't yet encountered any dudes who are explicitly homosexual, we have found one novel about a lesbian pirate, the eponymous Captain Volcano, and another about a same-sex marriage between two women. 
almost every major social, political, and cultural development of the late 19th century is also explored somewhere in a dime novel. Some of the earliest, for example, were written before or during the Civil War. In the back pocket of every Union soldier, supposedly, was the abolition novel Mom Guinea, which is told from the perspective of enslaved peoples in Louisiana. There are also series like Blue and Gray Weekly, which was written 40 years after the Civil War and is part of a still ongoing reunification effort. The series is about two friends separated by circumstances on the opposite sides of the conflict, each issue of which alternates between Union and Confederate perspectives. There are also novels about strikes, unions, and the labor movement, as well as temperance novels, which become increasingly common leading up to Prohibition. This makes the dime novel a great place for studying popular perspectives on these monumental events and movements. Dime novels are also of interest to those studying the evolution of genre, many of which have the origins of the dime novel format. Perhaps no genre is more closely associated with the dime novel than the Western. Long before Zane Grey, dime novels had written thousands of stories about Deadwood Dick, Buffalo Bill, and Jesse James. In the 1860s and 70s, these westerns were the most popular and most common dime novel genre. Eventually, however, cowboys gave way to urban detectives like Nick Carter, Old Sleuth, and Old King Brady. In fact, the first detective novel published in the U.S. is a dime novel, The Dead Letter by Mrs. Meta Victor. There are also many genres that have all but disappeared today, including railroad fiction and circus fiction. Perhaps most interesting of all are the genre mashups, usually detective fiction paired with some other genre. While most genres of popular fiction can trace their prehistory even earlier than the dime novel, many of the plot devices, characters, and tropes that have become so common today were first solidified in the format. Despite having so much potential, relatively little scholarship has been written about the dime novel, at least when compared to other formats of popular fiction like comic books, films, or even the pulp magazines. This is primarily a problem of access. Because dime novels are considered ephemeral, they were generally ignored by libraries and seldom treated with a great deal of reverence by readers. Unlike cloth-bound books, which might be cherished for years, dime novels were left behind on the train, used to line chicken coops, or reduced to tatters from so many successive readings. Because they were printed under paper covers, often with the cheapest and most acidic paper available, what dime novels did survive are today rapidly disintegrating. They exist almost solely because of passionate collectors who saw the value of these materials when cultural institutions did not. The problem is that there are only a handful of publicly available collections, limiting who has access to this important part of American history and culture. The Johansson Project and the Street and Smith Project seek to digitize these holdings and make them more widely available online, both to preserve these materials before they're gone and so that anyone with an internet connection can study the format. Hello, I'm Damian Katz, the Director of Library Technology at Villanova University's Falvey Memorial Library, and also one of the primary investigators on some recent dime novel related grant projects. Uh, I'm here today to talk about those projects and some of the online resources that they have produced. In 2016, Northern Illinois University and Villanova University were awarded a hidden collections grant by the Council on Library and Information Resources for the Johansson Project. The two principal goals of this project were to digitize the entirety of both institutions' Beadle and Adams holdings, the bulk of which is found in NIU's approximately 6,500 volume Johansson collection, and to publish the comprehensive bibliographic details from Albert Johansson's three-volume House of Beadle and Adams online as open-linked data. Uh, this was meant to be completed just in time to mark the 70th anniversary of the book's publication. In addition, we have also worked on developing teaching materials like lesson plans, which are the focus of this symposium. The dime novels digitized during the course of the grant have been made available on Nickels and Dimes, a website that features dime novels digitized from NIU's collections, as well as backup copies of selected titles from Villanova's repository. These dime novels are being incorporated into the teaching curriculum at NIU, where they are currently being used in several classes and are also the subject of faculty and student research. The project has the secondary goal of preserving what is, frankly, an important and endangered part of American history and culture. NIU's dime novel collections are among their most used and handled, but also their most fragile. Digitization ensures the existence of a digital surrogate, even if something should happen to the physical materials themselves. Making them available online means that anyone with an internet connection can visit our collections. This work addresses the first challenge Matt discussed earlier, democratizing scholarship in much the same way that dime novels themselves democratized reading. 
The website currently contains over 8,000 individual volumes with over 250,000 pages, and we're adding more dime novels every month as digitization progresses. And unlike most dime novel collections, which are only described by an inventory of issues for each series, every volume at NIU is fully and lovingly cataloged. This includes full subject analysis for each book, identifying things like genre, characters, geographic locations, and topics, as well as extensive name authority work to unpack the hundreds of pseudonyms that are used. Patrons are able to interact with this data using the browsable facets or by searching. We extract the text from each volume by means of optical character recognition, so each novel is also full text searchable. If you search within a book, the terms will be highlighted on the page. The quality of this OCR varies significantly from volume to volume, depending on factors like the condition of the item and the size and type of font used. Accuracy is usually around 70%, which is often good enough for keyword searching. We also provide access to all of this text for the purposes of text mining. Each novel can be previewed in a book viewer, or the entire volume can be downloaded as a PDF. While this presentation has focused on nickels and dimes, since it serves as the closest thing to a one-stop shop you can find for the publications of Beetle and Adams, it is not the only online dime novel collection available, and it cannot be reasonably expected to contain the entirety of online dime novels. Villanova's digital library contains a dime novel collection with more than 4,500 additional story paper and dime novel issues. Additional significant collections exist at other institutions, including Bowling Green State University, Stanford University, and the University of South Florida. Some institutions, such as Oberlin College, deposit digitized dime novels directly into the Internet Archive, and scatter titles can also be found in larger repositories like Hathi Trust and Google Books. Because digitized dime novels exist in so many different places, and because of their nature, the books can be difficult to organize and navigate. There's a need for a single source of information to help scholars find available titles, learn about those which have not yet been digitized, and explore the complex relationships discussed earlier. All of these needs are met by the Edward T. LeBlanc Memorial Dime Novel Bibliography, commonly referred to simply as dimenovels.org. While still a work in progress, its goal is to provide online entries for every series, issue, publisher, and author, unpacking the complex relationships that exist between dime novels, story papers, and related works. Named for dime novel collector and scholar Edward T. LeBlanc, and with a large portion of its data derived from LeBlanc's unpublished bibliographic work, this site has been hosted at Villanova University since 2012, and its content has been developed through the collaboration of many people at many institutions. NIU has been one of the longest serving and most deeply involved partners, first joining forces with Villanova during the very early days of the Nichols and Dimes project. The Johansson Grant has strengthened both the NIU Villanova partnership and the tools used for managing the bibliography. The grant's secondary goal of adding all of the data from Johansson's bibliography to dimenovels.org is very nearly complete. The loading of Johansson's data into dimenovels.org was done through a combination of automatic and manual methods. Much of the data was loaded by downloading NIU catalog records into the dimenovels.org database using a process that automated matching of stories on the basis of similarity. All of the automatically loaded data was checked against Johansson's bibliography, and data about volumes missing from NIU's and Villanova's collections was hand-entered by data entry staff. Having data entry staff also enabled us to go one step further than Johansson by also indexing the entire contents of each story paper and weekly. This included creating entries for every serialized story, short story, poem, and article. In doing so, users are able to see every version of a novel, no matter how much it might have changed between editions, and for the first time ever, thousands of previously unknown minor works are discoverable. As alluded to earlier, the bibliography also links out to full-text copies of the works wherever they might exist, not just in the collections of NIU and Villanova, but also in other places like the Internet Archive, Hathi Trust, and so forth. Having a comprehensive database of full text copies makes it easier to prioritize future digitization work. 
The DimeNovels.org system makes it possible to harvest the content of the bibliography as linked data, which makes it possible to reuse it in other contexts. For example, Nichols and Dimes leverages DimeNovels.org linked data to allow users to browse related editions of any story directly in the digital collection itself. This is intended to make it easier for patrons to compare editions so they can draw conclusions about how a story may have evolved over time. Effectively, this eliminates one of the major barriers to scholarship by making these relationships explicit and not obscured by the many different print bibliographies that would otherwise need to be carefully and independently consulted. We hope to also add a feature someday that will allow for side-by-side -side comparison of editions. While we've received a warm response to this work from the community of scholars and collectors, the uninitiated are sometimes daunted by the sheer volume of materials available. New researchers and students are faced with series that contain thousands of issues, many of them deliberately branded to look as similar to one another as possible. One of the most common complaints we encounter is from patrons who don't know where to start, which is especially troublesome because we can't continue digitizing dime novels if we can't establish that they're being used by faculty and students. The project is entirely grant funded and the cost of maintenance is borne by NIU, which has many other priorities. So we've begun to make more of an effort to develop resources for teachers and students. This began last year with the development of Spotlights, which are brief lesson plans featuring a particular novel. The novels we've done so far are either of historical or scholarly significance, like the abolition romance Malm Guinea, or stories we feel have not received enough attention, like the lesbian pirate novel Captain Volcano. We're currently working with faculty, graduate students, and scholars to develop more of these spotlights in the hopes of combining two or more into larger units on race, sexuality, or politics for undergraduate or high school classes. As digitization on the Johansson project wound down, we also set our sights on the next phase of digitization. We successfully submitted a proposal to the NEH to digitize the dime novels and story papers of Street and Smith. As the last major dime novel publisher, this would effectively bookend the dime novel era, setting us up to digitize the Monroes and Tausi next. But unlike the Johansson project, which involves digitizing a very comprehensive collection located in one place, this project involves a larger partnership with many more institutions. The first phase of the project includes the Stanford University, Bowling Green University, and Oberlin College Libraries, in addition to NIU and Villanova. Work has already begun, and Street and Smith dime novels are already beginning to appear in partner repositories and linked from dimenovels.org. By the time phase one of the project is completed, more than 4,000 new dime novel and story paper issues, adding up to over 100,000 pages, will be freely available online. We've already talked about a great deal, but there's always more to explore. Uh, this slide provides some useful links to online dime novel collections and the bibliography. Uh, you might also be interested in following us on social media for announcements of newly digitized titles and other information. And of course, I've also provided my email address because I'm always happy to answer questions or otherwise discuss this topic. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. I hope you are enjoying the symposium this far. My name is Sarah Kane, and I am the Curator of Rare Books and Special Collections at Northern Illinois University. And I have the pleasure of highlighting some of our collections and speaking to you about a fellowship opportunity that may be of interest. NIU Rare Books and Special Collections has over 10,500 rare books and 46 special collections containing hundreds of thousands of items. One of our most unique and fastest growing collections is our Gender Study Collection, which includes materials pertaining to women, gender, and sexuality studies. In addition to over 3,000 books, we hold several rare periodicals in and about the subject. We also have a complete collection of the Stonewall Award winners and nominees since 1971, which was the inaugural year for the award. The American Popular Literature Collection includes first and early editions of bestsellers, predominantly from 1866 to 1920. The collection also reflects America's reading habits over this period, including popular history, gift books, poetry, and other publications with mass appeal, such as boys and girls series books. NIU has one of the largest public collections of dime novels, which is comprised of items from three collections, the larger of the two being the Johansson and LeBlanc collections with supplementary series from the Merriwell collection. Recently, the digitization of our Beatles series was completed, which led to approximately 8,000 issues 
being available on the Nickels and Dimes website, which is linked to on this slide. Excitingly, NIU was just awarded an NEH grant to digitize our Street and Smith holdings. So look for those to be added to the site over the next several years as well. Our book arts collection not only documents the history of the book and works from well-known printers, illustrators, and type and book designers, but also includes our pop-up books and artist books collections, the latter of which is actively growing. The private press collection focuses on Midwestern presses, though we have examples from notable private and small presses from around the world. As part of this collection, we have a replica 17th, 18th century hand press that was built by a student in 1976 for his senior project. The NIU Common Press and its trademark can be seen in the images on this slide. Our rare books collection is particularly strong in 18th century English literature. The collection also contains large holdings of religious texts and English and American history books. We are also actively acquiring science fiction and fantasy books, magazines, and comic books. A subset of our sci-fi collection contains a few hundred items of material by and about Lovecraft. Complementary to our sci-fi book and magazine collections are our Swiftwell archives. This is the organization that awards the nebulas, and these archives hold the author papers of some of its members. We are also actively seeking archival collections that fit this collection as well. The last thing I want to note are some of the individual author collections that make up some of our 46 special collections. Um, they include UK and American authors, including Whitman, Blake, Burns, Byron, Dos Pesos, among several others. The main discovery points for RBSC materials are through our website, the library catalog, and Archon, which is a database containing finding aids for archival materials in the NIU library's distinctive collections. Aside from the dime novels, a selection of items from the Lee Schreiner Sheet Music Collection is available through the NIU Digital Library. This collection consists of several thousand pieces of sheet music from the early 20th century, and in particular pieces from World War I. On this slide, I wanted to talk a bit about the Horatio Algier Fellowship for the Study of American Popular Culture that is available to those conducting original research and using materials from our popular culture collections. RBSC collections that are supported by this grant include works authored by Horatio Algier Jr., dime novels, comic books, science fiction and fantasy books, as well as the author papers, and American and English popular literature before 1940. Candidates interested in the fellowship will need to submit a letter of interest, a curriculum vitae, a brief proposal of the research, and two letters of recommendation. The application is due May 31st of 2021, and research must take place between July 1st and December 31st of 2021. More details about this fellowship and information about how to submit application materials can be found at the link provided at the bottom of this slide. Provided on this last slide is my contact information as well as a direct URL to the Rare Books and Special Collections website. Please feel free to reach out if you need any assistance or have comments that you would like to share about the information or resources that I've provided you with today. I'm looking forward to learning how dime novels will be used in your classrooms, and I wish you the best of luck throughout the school year. Oh, hello! Didn't see you there. Well, welcome to NIU's Digitization Lab for the Albert Johansson Project. It's here where we scan all of the items that you might have found on Nickels and Dimes, our dime novel website database. It's here that we scan story papers, dime novels, nickel weeklies, or any of the other ephemera that you may be using in your research elements. Well, since you're here, let me show you around. In the Dig Lab, we have a secure room where all the items we'll be scanning are stored while they're away from their home in rare books and special collections. Right now, we're putting the finishing touches on some of the items that we didn't even know were in the collections. Most dime novels at NIU are stored safely in acid-free envelopes that not only protect the book, but also catch any of the inevitable pieces of cracked, dry paper in some of the more damaged items. 
some dime novels were bound into aftermarket volumes at some point in their lifespan. This volume of the weekly novelette has some of the most beautiful marbled in papers that we've found yet. When these sorts of volumes are very damaged, we disbind the volumes so they are both easier to scan and are protected from aging glue and tearing of rotting spines and string. Some bound volumes are too tight in the spine to open. Cradles and angled scanning can take care of those, but if I'm being entirely truthful, it's much more difficult without a lot of setup. This volume of the Nickel Library is probably going to be difficult, but the result will be worth it. For the Albert Johansson project, we don't have the ability to do the full conservation that so many of these items might benefit from. However, we can do minor repairs and preservation activities like unfolding, some light ironing, and removing some of the previous failed repair attempts. This issue of the New York Weekly is being scanned as part of the upcoming Street and Smith project and has suffered an unknown amount of time crunched, crushed, folded, spindled, and mutilated, but with a bit of care, we can recover the text. Student workers do most of the actual scanning. We use large format scanners from Zoichel. They have the benefit of being sturdy, but the difficulty of being troublesome to keep properly calibrated. The scanning bed has a glass platen that assists in flattening the items that we scan. It has two sides to the scan bed that can be independently moved to accommodate large books, or we can scan multiple objects at the same time. The camera is above the scanning bed and timed with the balanced lights to create an evenly lit, clear representation of the actual dime novel. Once the items have been scanned, students track their progress in shared documents, so we all know how far along we are in the process. This way, we can leave notes to each other, like this. Different advertisements, uncut edition, super fragile, be careful. Then students will crop and deskew the images for ease of viewing. We don't do any other edits to ensure we are presenting as truthful an image as possible. We want these images to be as close to the real object as we can get without researchers having to travel to Northern Illinois University itself. After cropping and deskewing, we do quality checks on every single image, looking for blurry focus, errors in scanning, and the odd paper crumble that gets in the way. Right now, almost all available surface is being used for the complex and fragile process of working with the larger format story papers. This lab has many tables for us to stage all of the items that have already and will eventually be digitized here. It's a little bit funny that NIU's digitization lab just happens to be right outside the microfilm and microfiche collection, as what digitization largely does is provide an upgrade to the access provided by these older formats. And last, all the scans are loaded into nickels and dimes, where you can see these 19th century artifacts of pop culture anywhere with an internet connection. We are so glad that you enjoy them as much as we do. All right. Am I back? You are back. Excellent. OK. So we're going to move on to the next phase, which is the discussion panel where we talk about teaching um, with dime novels. So we have a number of panelists who've already been joined, who have already joined. Uh, you've been made co-host, so you can feel free to mute and unmute anytime you want to participate or chime in. Um, I have a series of questions that will go around, but hopefully we can get some discussion going. If you have any questions, please throw them out there as well. Uh, the first is, um, for each of you, uh, beginning in alphabetical order, uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us more about your experiences using dime novels in the classroom? So I think we're starting with Dr. Adams Campbell. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you to um, Matt, Sata, and Damien, and um, all the people who have put this program together. It's really exciting to have been a part of the Dime Novel um, Symposium. And so thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, 
I am a scholar of early American literature and Native American literature. And so I primarily have taught dime novels um, in historical fiction classes in my early American undergraduate and graduate courses. And um, more recently, I had the great opportunity to teach, to co-teach a course on dime novels and film. And so with the film scholar in our English department here at Northern Illinois University, we talked about the evolution of genre as it moved from um, dime novels into film. So we focused primarily in that course on um, Westerns and melodramas as two of the, the primary genres that we were interested in. But again, um, most of the work that I have done in the classroom with dime novels is more thinking about race and particularly about representations of Native Americans um, in these collections. So that's a little about me. I think next up is Marlena. Well, I am Marlena Bramseth, and I am the editor of Dime Novel Roundup magazine. I have been since December of 2012, uh, the first woman to do so. Uh, I am also a retired or semi-retired professor, uh, English professor. I taught dime novels in the context of my detective fiction courses um, and also in my uh, history of the book. So. Usually, if you know, I was discussing uh, the history of the book, I would certainly bring in dime novels, which were not added usually in that kind of a setting. Um, um, in terms of detective fiction, I taught uh, African American detective fiction and also regular detective fiction, and almost always started with dime novels um, or one or two as the source of my background. In terms of scholarship, I am a dime novel scholar. I'm also a detective fiction scholar and a popular culture literature scholar. So I've got a lot of, you know, <laughs> uh, what do I want to say? Do I have a lot of titles under my belt? But I would like to stop and just say one thing, please. And, and also thank you for inviting me to participate in this. I'm very honored to be here. And I know it's a lot of work. I know I've talked to Matt and and of course, I love Demi and, and Matt and everybody. Uh, but I would like to do a shout out to Joe Raynone, who I notice is here uh, as part of this. Joe is recovering from COVID. And so, Joe, I love you. And I'm glad to see that you're here with us this evening. OK, I saw his picture. I don't know if you can unmute him so he can say something, but, but, but glad to see you, Joe. OK. Um, so that's all that I can tell you. I've taught, uh, I am not teaching right now because I am doing Dime Novel Roundup and I actually have another business. Uh, I have taught at numerous institutions because my husband was a naval officer, so we moved around and I got a wealth of experience and I would like to say uh, perspective from teaching not only on the East Coast, the West Coast and overseas. So. Um, I just, you know, I'm happy to participate in this and to offer what I can about my teaching experiences. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is Nancy. You might need to unmute. I don't, there we go. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Nancy Coronia. I'm an associate professor at West Virginia University and I'm thrilled to be here. I wanna ask, I wanna thank Matt for inviting me. And it's great to hear about the work that you're all doing in ways that I didn't know about and to hear about other people's work. What I'd like to say is that I use, I am not a scholar of dime novels. I came through to dime novels in the back door. Um, I earned a PhD in globalization, looking at global cities and talking about race and ethnicity. Uh, what happened was I was looking for, part of my scholarship is in Italian American studies, and I was looking to see if there were any Italians ever mentioned in dime novels. And at first I was told there weren't, and then I started searching. And I found, without even trying, 30 issues that had Italians or Italian Americans as main characters, usually antagonists, and my journey began. And what's happened in that time is that I decided, once I got a hold of the nickel and dime collection, I realized that it was a great resource for my undergraduate students because it's searchable, 
it's easily relatable, they can look for things very easily. So I've taught dime novels in a course that I taught around Italian American stereotype. Um, because Italian American stereotype is Italian Americans are criminals, they're mafiosi. And there's a scholar in Italian American studies, Fred Gardefe, who says that that criminality and that mask of the mafiosi started with film. And once I started reading dime novels, I realized it began before film. So when I teach the class, I try to help students understand, you know, when we're talking about immigration, when we're talking about migration, we have to remember the kind of discrimination and prejudice that occurred 100 years ago to Italian Americans, white ethnics. I also use the dime novels, however, I am part of a program at West Virginia University called the Research Apprentice Program that allows uh, faculty members to bring undergraduate researchers fairly early in their career to start to do research. So for the last two years, I've had two students a year help me as I'm reading through the dime novels. And it's been a great experience for them. My two students from last year are now working on their own projects around immigration. One is working on immigration in Spain and another one is working on immigration in West Virginia. And I think that part of the reason why they gravitated to that subject matter is not totally, but in part because of my work with the dime novel and their work with the dime novel. So I look forward to talking about it a little more, but I'm really thrilled to be here, so thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Fred is up next. All right, well, good evening, everybody. It's great to see you. I, I see a lot of familiar faces and familiar names, and I really am glad to be uh, joining you. I'm Fred Stark, and I teach currently in the Department of Language and Literature at Texas A&M University in Kingsville. And I am a dime novel enthusiast. I think I could call myself a dime novel scholar as well. I wrote a dissertation at Northern Illinois University that incorporated some research into dime novels by a particular dime novelist who goes by the pen name Roger Starbuck. And uh, many of his works have traces of the influence of earlier writers of sea fiction, or I should say nautical fiction. And I got interested in his work because I was doing uh, research related to nautical fiction of the 19th century, particularly American nautical fiction. And so I became aware of the dime novel collections and then became a scholar of those collections at NIU. And I'd like to say, before I say how I taught with these materials, it was great to see that overview of how you've been doing the digitized or the digitization and it brought back some happy memories of the library at NIU. Those are some great uh, uh, images that you showed of the process of doing the digitization, which I had not seen because it had not begun in earnest when I started my research. I was also a Horatio Alger fellow and that, that uh, fellowship was mentioned. And I do recommend uh, if you have an interest, anyone who is listening to try and explore the dime novel collections through that fellowship. I have used dime novels in undergraduate literature courses, and these would be lower, they were, were lower division courses, primarily consisting of students who are not majoring in English. And so I think that from that perspective, I could offer some insights on how you bring or how you create the bridge between the interests of students of, of, who are coming to English studies from other disciplines how do you create the bridge between their interests and these particular materials? I've actually used dime novels by the novelist Roger Starbuck. He wrote primarily standalone uh, works of nautical fiction. And I've also taught the novel Seth Jones, which was one of the first uh, really popular uh, dime novels, which is an adventure uh, story and also touches on features of the Western, kind of anticipates the growth of the Western. And one thing I can say is that when I've done it, I've actually limited the way we look at the materials. I've also restricted our examinations to selected chapters and then invited students, if they find the story interesting, to keep reading by going on to nickels and dimes. So I could perhaps say a little more about those methods. And so that's about it for me. And I will then turn the floor back over to Matt. 
Thank you, Fred. Uh, finally is Dr. Williams. Hi, thank you. Uh, Nathaniel Williams from the University of California, Davis. And I just want to congratulate Matt and Damien again on the NEH grant. I know they put a lot of work into that and it's, it's going to be neat to watch that come into fruition. Uh, my own work, uh, I, I wrote a book called Gears and God, uh, Technocratic Fiction, Faith and Empire in Mark Twain's America, which is kind of a mouthful, but that's really what I'm looking at is in the uh, the lifetime of Mark Twain, which is around 1830 to 1910, uh, what kind of science fiction was written. So that's been my access point to dime novels has been through science fiction. Um, and, and that has resulted in some articles that I've published on Nick Carter um, and on uh, the Frank Reed Jr. Boy Inventor novels and their author, Lou Sinarins, uh, who wrote under the pseudonym No Name and he uh, was probably the most prolific Cuban-American writer of the 19th century and, and was called the American Jules Verne by subsequent publishers. So uh, that's, that's, again, been my uh, interest. As far as in the classroom, then, I, I've done most of it through that science fiction lens. Uh, I've, I've taught the Steam Man of the Prairies in a class on 19th century science fiction, which was a, a, another undergraduate class. Uh, to non-majors. And then I also teach it in a, in a at, I taught that at the University of Kansas where the Center for the Study of Science Fiction is. And then now at, at UC Davis, uh, I teach a first year seminar on steampunk. And we always cover the steam out of the prairies and talk about that as an antecedent uh, for steampunk. And that's fun because it is, it's, it's incoming freshman students uh, who, who are, are open to kind of seeing where some of these ideas came from. Um, so, so those are the areas I'm happy to talk more about any of those. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to the questions now. I do want to invite any of the other panelists who are talking tomorrow and to please feel free to raise their hand if they want to jump in and contribute anything. Um, and we'll go ahead and unmute you. But so the first question is, as most of you know, the contents of dime novels can sometimes be profoundly offensive with abundant examples of racism and sexism. This isn't something unique to the format, obviously, but it might be more pervasive than in other literature that is often assigned and taught. So how do you deal with this in the classroom? How do you prepare students to be offended? Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to jump in first, feel free. <laughs> Well, I'd like to jump in first, if I sure, might. Sure, go for it. And my question to counter that is, why is there an assumption that the students will be offended? If the students are actually prepared for the idea that this was literature that is obviously outdated by our standards, our modern standards, then why even raise that specter that, they're, that they might be offended? Let them read the literature and get from it what they will. Um, uh, when I think that uh, the challenge of teaching literature created over 100 years ago is to review it through the lens of when it was produced rather than through our modern lens in perspective. I mean, I mean the, the assumption by many of the dime novel writers was that a lot of their readers were literate and they certainly were a lot more literate um, than what we would say by our standards today. They make a lot of biblical references. They make uh, mythological references, not only Greek mythology, but Roman mythology. These are things that not necessarily our students of today are prepared um, for. So why, uh, I, that's a question I would ask. Um, and offense is only if someone really thinks, you know, if you're looking at it from the modern lens, like for instance, okay, so I teach and have taught, you know, uh, Philip S. Warren, whom I discovered was the first person of African-American descent to publish a dime novel. I don't approach his literature when I'm teaching it and when I have taught it as Philip S. Warren was a victim. No, he was a victor. <laughs> the guy got over on Beetle and Adams and, and published almost 61 dime novels between 1875 and 1892 uh, without letting them know that he was mixed race. That's not victimhood. So I think that I, I have to ask that question and begin by saying that, why would we assume that they will be offended? And I'll shut up. Maybe I'll follow um, and say, in my experience, students are pretty um, 
ready to be offended. <laughs> um, and, and so there definitely needs to be preparation before you um, dive into some of this. And I think especially if you're going to teach frontier fiction like I do, um, that you have to prepare them for the um, representations of Native Americans in particular that they're likely to see. And so when we talk about the genre of the Western or about the goals of frontier fiction, we definitely want to understand that the really fantasy spaces, right? They're, they're not authentic depictions of 19th century America. They're fantasy spaces in the same way that sci-fi steampunk <laughs> are. And, and I think that it's really important to start there, right? So what are the goals of these really graphically violent, extremely racist and problematic depictions? And why are we reading this stuff, right? And so what are the goals of reading that material? Um, because we, we could be reading other things, right? So what is it that we get when we look at these popular texts, which more people were reading Seth Jones than they were reading, um, you know, uh, some of the, the more high literary texts uh, that we think of today as, as important 19th century writers. And so, you know, if, if we come at it from that angle, right, like what were readers getting from these stories? What was the fantasy that they so wanted <laughs> in these texts? And that fantasy is clearly not an authentic depiction of any particular group of people. Um, and, and so beginning there, I think probably Nancy has a lot to say about Italian immigrants as well, right? So these are fantasy um, stereotypes. So just beginning to think at the very beginning about the work of stereotypes and what the work of stereotypes do for a mainly and primarily, I would say, um, white 19th century working class and middle class audience, right? Um, not to say that there couldn't be other kinds of readers, but primarily these things are being targeted to um, white readers. So what are they getting from these texts? And for me, that is a really important distinction. Um, and I think that also beginning there, it's important for students to see not only that these texts, I think are offensive by today's standards, um, that, that they fulfill a kind of fantasy function, right? And so in thinking about them in that way, we can say that fantasy function is not particularly different in a popular text like Seth Jones versus what we might say is a more literary work um, by James Fenimore Cooper, though people dislike him as well, right? So, <laughs> um, so that's probably enough of an answer for me to just get us started. Um, thank you both. For me, as I'm, as I'm teaching and I'm learning about dime novels, what I'm struck by is the way in which the stereotype is established fairly quickly and that that stereotype, particularly of Italian Americans, has, it's carried over for a hundred years, right? Um, they're mafiosi, there are stories of the black hand, which is a fiction created by Americans to make white Americans afraid of Ital Southern Italians in particular as they came to Italy. And what's interesting about that stereotype is that it moved directly into film, Paul Muni and Scarface, you know, and then it, it sort of transformed or evolutionized with The Godfather when Italian Americans started telling the stories themselves, you know, American so and Francis Ford Coppola and then David Chase. But what is remarkable to me about, in particular, I'll talk about the Nick um, Carter stories, because that's where the proliferation of Italian Americans begins. So though I found an issue from 1872 in Beetle Dime Stories, um, The Branded Brigand, um, The White Outlaw and The Branded Brigand, where there is an Italian who's disguised as some other in a mining camp in California. And what happens is, is it's revealed that he's an Italian, perhaps a political refugee. That's talking specifically about the reunification in Italy. And there are these terms that are borrowed from Italy, from Northern Italians. And then they get used by the authors of dime novels and sort of reiterate the stereotypes that Northern Italians have about Southern Italians. So we get this sort of transference 
from Italy, from Northern Italy, from the dominant class in Northern Italy, and all of a sudden Italians, particular Southern Italians, are branded in the same way. And by the time we get to Nick Carter, the stereotype is so large and looms so big that Nick Carter, who, you know, we know about disguises, but the disguises that he's doing, he puts on brown polish or, you know, all of his body is brown. He can change from one wig to another and he's Italian and then he's, you know, African-American. Um, and it and so there's this line that gets crossed there with Italians that it's like Italians are white, but they're not quite white. And it gets proliferated then throughout the whole Nick Carter series. Every time it pops up, they're always putting on this sort of, um, I'll say a minstrel show, right? Of of the performativity of what it means to be Italian. So for my students, when I'm teaching, I actually talk not only about immigration with them to set them up as they read this, but I talk about um, black minstrelsy in the United States in the 19th century. I talk about the ways in which whiteness puts on black face, then puts on brown face, puts on red face. And in dime novels, they put on yellow face, right? You know? um, so I think it's important for them when they meet that to understand what that is. And I'll actually even have conversations with them about contemporaneity. I want them to tell me what they know about prejudice and discrimination and stereotype in their lives today. So that when we go back and we look at a dime novel, they sort of have an on context for why this might have been happening in the way that it was happening. And they can enter, they're still, they're still shocked by some of it. Um, but, th but they also are able to then make, provide context and comparisons, not only to when it was written, but to what's happening in their world today, because they hear all the stories today about migrants and the wall and, and all of that, that they have to make sense of. They don't understand it and they want to make sense of it. All right. I've said a lot. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> I know that you probably want to move on, but I, if I could just chime in, that's actually the thought that I had is if you are working with students today, I mean, let's not forget, we could, if we wanted, imagine readers from the 19th century being introduced to some of the popular fiction and other popular art forms that we have in our time. I'm sure we would offend them just as well. I mean, and so, you know, offensiveness is something that you, you could assume, but I also want to echo what Marlena was saying that maybe by assuming that there's going to be a problem, uh, it might actually complicate it a little more. Sometimes if you dive into the story and just introduce students to it, let them discover what it is that might be strange or might be familiar to them. But I would just, that was what I wanted to add is that, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll add it by saying, let, let's also remember that these dime novels have different uh, modes of expression in them, don't they? We have the narrative of the author, but then we have these various characters. And one way in which the offense, the, the oddness can come forward is when we look at the way characters are described and also the way they talk, their dialogue. And so it could be that if you wanted to say, well, let's look at the way speech is represented in these characters before you go into the 19th century um, examples, you could just uh, elicit some ideas from students about how language, whether it's vulgar or frank or something is portrayed in contemporary films, television, radio, rock and roll, rap music, on the street. I mean, we have plenty of examples of vernacular usage that we could turn to. And then we go into the 19th century materials and it, it, I think it's both familiar and strange. And that's where there's learning that can take place. I just want to uh, echo a couple of things and maybe add to it a little bit. One thing I've noticed in teaching to uh, you know incoming first year students, um, when I teach the Steam Man of the Prairies, I actually do a poll and say, okay, how, how did you feel about this after you you know should I teach this? And it's usually 50-50. I mean, 50% of students are like, I, I just didn't like it. It wasn't exciting to me. It, uh, rarely are there complaints about the the racism in that text. And in fact, what I found is my students are really offended by steampunk from the, uh, or cyberpunk from the 80s and 90s because they don't have this expectation that, you know, there's, there's this expectation those people should have known better. The, the writers of the 80s and 90s. And so that sort of brings us into a couple of these cultural myths that we really have to deal with. One is that there's this willingness to sort of forgive 
the dime novel writers because people just thought that way back then. When in fact, no, pointedly, as, as China Mieville says about H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, you know, no, in fact, people did not all think that way back then. That's a real, uh, uh, you know, that, that is also a myth that we need to sort of bust. Um, but then the other thing is when we read some of the series and see the, the treatment of, of all the different uh, ethnic stereotypes that are portrayed there, it is interesting to see some of these wide pendulum swings uh, that I found certainly in the Frank Reed novels where, where there'll be, um, you know, a, the character Pomp, who's an African-American character, is portrayed just, uh, they mock him mercilessly. Uh, and yet also in the same, sometimes the same paragraph, he's portrayed as a heroic figure, right? He's a hero, um, which of course I've just described what Mark Twain does to characters in his texts too. And that's the other cultural myth that I have to sort of dismantle for my students. It's like, well, these dime novels do it, but they're kind of trashy pulp stuff. But it, you know, Mark Twain can do it and it's a smart thing when Mark Twain does it. When Lou Cinerans does it, cause he's a, you know, Cuban American guy from Brooklyn uh, who was writing many of these per month to, to, to put groceries on the table. Uh, he doesn't get the same benefit of the doubt as the more genteel uh, Mr. Clemens gets. And so I think that's one of the things when I talk about what offends my students, we, we do need that additional context of kind of where do these things come from and, and what assumptions do we have about the way people in the 1880s, 1890s actually thought about things. Yeah, I guess I want to really quickly respond to that and just say it's helpful um, to show students alternative thinking or more progressive thinking um, in contrast to these often very negative stereotypes. And so, for instance, if you're thinking about frontier Western stories, you might show um, the ladies of Steubenville petition against Indian removal, right? Uh, so there were people who were activists and were actively petitioning Congress to um, prevent Native Americans from being moved West, right? And so just as we have clearly very mixed political opinions in our country now, we also have very um, mixed political opinions in um, the past, right? And that is, I think, a really productive um, mode to, to break down that assumption, um, as, as Nate, Nate suggesting, right, of the myth that that's just the way people thought, because it's, it's a much more complicated landscape than, than that assumption makes. I can make one more last comment. Um, what I said, and, and I will caveat that by just simply saying that when I taught it, and you know, obviously I'm the only one seemingly on this panel who is not still teaching. But what, what my point was is why set a context for the students in their learning experience beforehand? And that's why I said, why should there be an assumption? Yes, there are all sorts of stereotypes, all sorts of things in the dime novels that I, you know, I don't wanna use the word offensive because it's historical. This is historical. We are teaching literature of history. And it was created at a time when these were things that were commonplace. And it's and so therefore, when I prepared my students, I usually gave them the history and the context in which the production of the literature was being done so that they understood, yes, it isn't what we think now, but it was what they thought back then. And either, you know, and my and I I would hazard the guest to say, if you're going to tell them that it's going to be offensive, then you're setting them up. And that was my point. I don't think that that is necessarily the right thing to do. Let them read the literature. And if they want to ask the questions, and if they want to then think critically and say, wow, this was a really outdated opinion that they had of Italians or they had of the Chinese, you know, because of the Chinese, you know, uh, or, or, or even black people for that matter, then that's okay but I wanted them to come to it without then leading them to that, to that point. But once again, I do have to tell you, I taught them in the context of teaching detective fiction as well. So I had a lot of other you know, uh, processes that they needed to go through in analyzing the detective fiction stories. So I just wanted to, to, to clarify what I meant about 
providing them with historical context because I think that's all that sounds to me like what all of you are doing anyway. You're giving them historical context. But when I read this question at first, that was the first question that came to my mind was, well, why do we want to assume that it's offensive when by our standards, I guess it could be, but I will, I'm not offended by it because I understand that it was created at a different time and space. And I'll shut up, okay? No, you know, that's great. Thank you for saying that. Um, when, I, when I teach what winds up happening, when I teach dime novels, what winds up happening is I'm in an English department, but I wind up able to turn them on to history they didn't know like the Chinese Exclusion Act, like the unification you know, of Italy. Um, even the, a police detective, Joseph Petrosino, that Nick Carter is based on, clearly to me. You know? um, and so they get to learn about the things that they didn't know about. And it always provides a bigger and bigger context. I'll give them newspaper articles. Um, Bingham, who was the New York City police commissioner, um, I give them articles where he basically says Italians are the second worst in a group group in the state. <laughs> you know, because I want them to understand. And then I'll give them a piece from somebody who was in the order of Italians, Gaetano. Because I want them to see that there's a conversation going on between the two of them in the same magazine over months. Uh, but, it, but for me, dime novels opens a larger world for them. As opposed to if I give them a piece of literature like um, Nate, you were saying a piece of higher literature, like Mark Twain, you know, they have certain expectations when they get to Mark Twain, but if I give them a dime novel, they don't have as many expectations of what it's supposed to be about. Um, but Mark Twain, they like, or Shakespeare, right? They get to it and they're like, oh, I'm supposed to behave a certain way when I read this. But they don't have that with dime novels. They can sort of enter into the dime novel as they would an Aaron Spelling show, for lack of a better metaphor at the moment. <laughs> How many people I, I, know who Aaron Spelling is? <laughs> I think I, this is. Oh, I go agree. ahead. I'll just just quickly. I, I really agree with that. And in fact, some students are. It's almost refreshing to them to have something that is, uh, just on its face, blatantly. Here's here's how it thinks expansion in the West should work. It, it's not trying to hide it. It's not feeling guilty about it. Um, and, and my students are often so used to reading carefully, trying to see what the hidden agenda of a text is. And, and, and this, is, this is not that, right? And so they, that, that is one thing that they seem to appreciate about it. And, and uh, I can't say they like it, but they appreciate it. Right? Okay, that's it. Thank you. I think this is all great conversation, but I do wanna move on to a couple more questions before we run out of time. Um, so perhaps it's less common today, at least at the college level, but there's still sometimes resistance to teaching popular fiction. Have you encountered any pushback in teaching dime novels, either from administrators or from your students? And if you haven't received any pushback, why do you think teaching these materials is important? So the big why te teach popular fiction from the 19th century question, what's the value? So I'm gonna jump in here really quickly because I teach a foundations of literature class. And I always teach a graphic novel in it. And it's the first time because they're all first year students. And when I tell them they're allowed to read graphic novels, they all almost fall out of their chairs because they, it has been drummed in. Now I live in West Virginia. It might be different in other places, but in West Virginia, they are told very clearly that graphic novels are not real literature, they're comics, and they have no place in terms of English language study. So they get, they're free all of a sudden they're allowed to read things outside of the genre uh, of what they were told they're allowed to read. And I feel the same thing is true for dime novels. Nobody's pushed back on me, but nobody has also given me an entire class at WVU. I was asked last year, the class that I taught on Italian literature um, and stereotype was at University of Pittsburgh. They invited me, the Italian department invited me to teach a class on Italian American experience. Nobody's asking me to do that at WVU. So I'm a sneak, right? I sneak things in into general education classes, into foundation of literature classes, but nobody yet has said, oh, you should be teaching a whole class on this. <laughs> so I just wanna be honest. <laughs> May I step in? When I first got involved with dime novels many moons ago, <laughs> One of the things that was very clear to me was if I said to someone that dime novels were one of my specialties of scholarship, they said, what? What are those? 
And, you know, I, I know what is responsible for our collective ignorance of them is the fact that they were not deemed worthy of intellectual scrutiny by the literati of the time when they were being produced. But um, in terms of pushback, when I was at uh, the College of William and Mary and I was uh, teaching, I, I introduced to one of my professor, one of my other professors, a dime novel in a history of the book class. And he had never heard of dime novels. And he was, and I said, how can you teach history in the book class without having at least some knowledge of this literature? So I actually gave him one of my dime novels. And he actually eventually got a Fulbright fellowship. I think it was a Fulbright. He went to Denmark and he took it with him and he taught it in the course that he taught in Denmark. And he thanked me for that. Although the, I will say, you're talking about the one thing that I have gotten back from students, which I think is hilarious. And the one criticism is they say the print is too small. They're, you know, oh, why are you having us read this? The print is too small, it's too little. I, I have to use a magnifying glass to read it. So that's one of the pushbacks that I got, especially in my detective fiction classes. Now, when, when I taught Who Was Guilty by Philip S. Warren, which is a book I edited and put in my book, then it was in larger print. So the students stopped complaining to me when they would read the edited, my edited version of it. And the other thing that they also thought was they didn't like it when dime novel authors would attempt to use dialogue um, and to spell the words the way in which, say, if they had a French character, oh, you know, the what is this? You know, they would, you know, they didn't like that. You know, in one of the stories, there was an Irish character and they hated the fact that they couldn't pronounce the words because they were, the, the author had written them as if an Irish person was actually speaking. So that's the only thing. But, you know, in terms of, I did, I have over the time gotten from some, some of my fellow, you know, co, you know, you know, why do you want to teach dime novels that, you know, what, what, what for, you know, but no, no real major pushback. I think I, I, I think I like this. I'd like to just chime in briefly because, you know, this semester I am teaching, I, I was teaching, I am teaching a course and I was using, I did use a, a, a story paper story by this <laughs> author, Roger Starbuck. And I mentioned that because I've used one of his dime novels, some chapters from it before. And when I, when I did that, and when I've used Seth Jones, and this one, get any from the student. And one of the students this semester said, what, what, what were the factors that went into your decisions for, for, uh, for uh, making the syllabus? Uh, by the way, am I on? The, okay, I don't know if I just clipped off. Sorry if there was a slight uh, camera. <laughs> cam sorry about the camera delay there. So in any event, I don't get it from the students. I think they're actually usually quite interested because these, these things really stand out. But I want to jump in on that and just get this opportunity to say, that yeah, you are going to be dealing with some specialized vocabulary in many of these materials. And especially in the sea fiction, uh, with Roger Starbucks works, you've got a lot of nautical jargon that's just placed in there. He actually went to sea, he was someone who had those experiences. And in the same way that you get it in, let's say Moby Dick, you, know, you get whaling terms. But of course in that novel, Melville takes the time to explain what many of them mean. Not this author. There's not enough time for that, and especially in the story paper stories, it's very compressed. So that's one thing that I would say. Finally, just I I was at a conference and I was it was it dealt with nautical fiction, and I was talking to some people about this author who I think is is fairly neglected, and uh, the impression was they said, well, okay, but dime novels, and they were sort of thinking of sea serpents or mystical mermaids and things. And I think sometimes maybe the dime novel is associated with stories of that nature that are quite fantastic. And I know that Ned Buntline, one of the big dime novelists who wrote a lot of works of nautical fiction is sometimes associated with such things. And the, the study by Mary Noel, when she's looking at story papers, she mentions Ned Buntline and his penchant for you know pirates and sea serpents and strange forces at sea. But this, this writer that I'm talking about, he does stand out in a lot of ways because many of his works are actually grounded in a realistic treatment of maritime affairs with a few supernatural elements occasionally woven in. But uh, and so I think maybe just to, to summarize, it might not be resistance from students that you want to be thinking about if those are who are participating here, if you're teaching, I think you want to be 
uh, uh, aiming to try to convince colleagues that there is a worth to, you know, there is a great deal of worth in these materials. Yeah, I guess um, really quickly, I would also echo the, the sort of sentiment that students really appreciate having different kinds of texts. Um, and my students have really um, vociferously, in fact, commented on dime novels in a positive way in their um, final evaluations, just like the opportunity to engage with popular literature, especially in my early American literature courses. Uh, and so the, the you know, I often spend a lot of time talking about captivity narratives, nonfiction captivity narratives. That's just a part of early American writing. Um, and then we see how that story has evolved um, across um, and into fiction, right? And even, of course, later with film. And so being able to trace some of the, the afterlives of those initial um, early writing um, features that, that we think about is something that's really appealing to students and they appreciate the opportunity of thinking about some different kinds of questions, right? And so like, what, uh, as I already said, what is the value um, of, of this text for such a large mass of people, right? And like, what was entertaining about the story in the 19th century? And what were people getting from that? I think those are really helpful questions. Also, I wanted to say really quickly, because I didn't say, um, that if you're going to teach a frontier fiction or something that's like uh, really thinking about Native American stereotypes, I strongly encourage all the teachers uh, to add at the end of that unit a text by a Native American person. <laughs> it's a really helpful move to kind of push back there. So, you know, if you want to um, have ideas about what 19th century, especially um, Native texts to teach, you can find my information at NIU. I, I was just going to give a quick answer to Matt's original question, which is, um, I have not had any uh, negative feedback from students. Um, about just the difference between dime novels and other literature, they're they're pretty receptive. Um, at, uh, when I taught at a smaller school, you know, four-year uh, liberal arts school college, uh, there was kind of this sense that you don't teach anything off the radar. You don't teach anything that's not in the Norton anthology that you're required to, to use. But again, I think that may have been the more the personality of a smaller department and the particular administration that they had there. At, at, uh, at UC Davis, it's nothing but encouragement. So that's, for what it's worth, that's my answer. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to try to combine a few questions together since we're kind of running short on time. So what are some other challenges to teaching with these materials that we haven't talked about already? And what advice would you give to someone considering teaching dime novels in the classroom? So what are the challenges and what do you recommend doing? Well, okay, I, I think I, I have some things to say about this because I do have some fairly recent experience. And so uh, earlier, uh, Marlene was mentioning that the print can be very small in these materials. But of course, the digitized versions, you know, th these are then PDFs. You can certainly, ex uh, uh, what, uh, zoom in on the screen and you can make the, the text larger. So that's actually an advantage. But what I think is a, a counterpart to this is there's a, a, a sense that these materials are actually larger than they are. You know, they actually sometimes look a little big when they're in the PDF format. So I would say sometimes to try to make these materials a little more tangible. We're not usually in the classroom showing them how these fragile materials really look. That's why I really liked the, uh, the video, which gave a sense of the size, even in your hand. And so maybe even having something like a four by six piece of cardboard or something just to say, well, this is about the size of what the original dime novel would have been like. So I think what it seems to be one of the challenges is, to, you know, I was saying earlier, how do you get the students of today interested in something from this time? And how do you make it relevant to them? Of course, you need to, to uh, scaffold your lessons. You know, you need to explain why we're looking at this. But another thing would be to try to bring the immediacy of these things, which you can't really do when you don't have the original text in your hand. 
I would say, if I may go next, are you done? Are you done? All yours. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. I would say um, my advice to anyone who's teaching, whether at the high school or the college level, is as instructors first, read the entire story. I mean, just read it first for yourself. You know, go through it and then go through it and then look for the things that might be of interest to your students. I have a couple of them listed here. Social commentary. Um, are there any political references in the story? Uh, you can certainly address race. Uh, what about customs and traditions and any mores? And then in characterization, what are the, some of the relationships between the characters in the story? And um, do some characters do good deeds or bad deeds? Uh, what are their motivations behind what they're doing? That's always a very popular one. And of course, you know, as a detective fiction scholar, that's one of the things that I'm always focusing on and have is what are the motivations? Why, you know, who done it and why did they do it? And what is the author saying? You know, what, what is the voice of the author? What are they saying to us as readers? Also, you know, the writing styles are very important. And are there any journeys? Are there any journeys, transformations? You know, what about violence or not? You know, all of those things. But the first and foremost is you read it first for yourself to see what you get out of it. And then you can then, you know, go in and try to figure out ways in which to present it to your students. I think that is, um, but, but, you know, and try to do it in a well-rounded way. It doesn't have to just be about gender. It doesn't have to just be about race. You know, there are, you know, a lot of these stories by the dime novel authors deal with a lot of different other things as well. And, and, and look at the, his, you know, and once again, I'm, I sound like a broken record, but the historical context is very important because that's the value of this literature. You know, you can say what you want to say, you know, a lot of my, you know, people I was worked with the detractors, oh, well, you know, dime novels, you know, you know, you know it doesn't matter. Their historical value is so important and it lets us know what people were thinking about and, and everything back in the time. So that would be my advice to anyone who wants to teach them. Just open your mind, read it, and just go with the flow. Okay. Can I jump in just after that and say that one of the pieces of advice I'd give people is maybe if you've got the time, read the daily New York newspaper from a few months before that dime novel appeared, we'll <laughs> find, I mean, and, and, and Nancy, I'm thinking of your stuff with Nick Carter, where it really, you know, it literally is like, they're portraying the actual police chief who investigated the crime that they based this on. And, and that's clearly, that's not something that you'll get if you just read it and, and have, are looking at the story in its own, uh, you know, not looking at anything outside the text. So I think, yeah, that's 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 the one tip I'd give people. And I know it's tremendously hard to do, uh, you know, given the, the amount of free time teachers don't have, but it, it's worthwhile. Yeah, so I'm going to reiterate what everybody said. <laughs> um, uh, I really believe in, in digging up the text of the time to go along with the dime novel. I think it's imperative that they understand the larger context. But I also, with what Melissa said, give the, if you're looking at stereotypes and there are stereotypes, I would make sure that you have an author of that time who's written something else, you know, some self-representation rather than this other kind of representation, which is stereotype. And it's surprising to me how little how little we actually give our students of Native American writers of the 19th century, early 20th century. Same thing, Italian Americans. There's plenty of stuff out there, but we don't always think to say, let me give you this and let's look at this in context with the dime novel. So for me, that's super important in the way that I teach and the way that I want them to expand their own curiosity and their knowledge base. I was reminded that I've been talking so much about race that I didn't talk about what I'm actually teaching this semester, which is a gen ed class um, 
about money, 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 wealth in American literature. And so I'm teaching a fame and fortune weekly dime novel, um, which they're all about like Wall Street. And um, this one's called Out for a Corner, um, a Chicago boy. I can't even remember the whole title now. It's terrible. <laughs> but it's a great Gatsby kind of story. And so if you think about the work of a great Gatsby in a high school literature class, out for a Corner or any Fame and Fortune Weekly is a great pair. Um, and you can think about that kind of pursuit of the American dream and what are these more popular texts doing in that same vein um, and thinking about comparing high and, and middle brow or low <laughs> kind of texts is really a great move to give students. Um, and, and I think there you, you dodge all sticky questions of race and you can just like go right for um, these kind of American dream sort of questions that are um, really fundamental to often our, our teaching. Um, and one thing that I would really suggest that you do is if you have the time in your teaching, ask students to go and look at some other issues of the same story paper, right? And so, for instance, Fame and Fortune Weekly, we read one particular story, but I asked my students in a kind of reflective reading journal type assignment, go look at at least five more of these. What are they about? Who do you think this is for? What other kinds of stories are, do you see um, in this series? And just like, you don't have to read them all, right? Just look at the cover, skip, skim through a couple pages. Uh, and that ability to see what the series as a whole, or even five issues of <laughs> a series, right? Um, might really illuminate for them the kind of repetition of these stories, which I think is really um, a lot of where Great Gatsby comes from is this kind of, uh, you know, rich boy on the Wall Street market, he's going to make it um, rich quick. And so when you think about uh, where some of that stuff comes from, you know, dime novels are a great source <laughs> of thinking about uh, the the um, propensity for great Gatsby type characters in the world. Yeah. So I think I can lead on from that to maybe our final question, which is there are kind of two ways to approach teaching with dime novels. So we can focus narrowly on the text, maybe in conversation with some canonical literature, um, which is probably the most common model for literature classes or we could try to look at many dime novels and draw broader conclusions about the format or about the genre. So we can focus narrowly on a particular text and maybe just give a little dime novel or try to incorporate a lot of it. So can you talk more about the pros and cons of each approach? So close reading versus kind of distant reading. I think that rather depends on how much time you have. Um, wouldn't the rest of you agree with me? I mean, it depends on how much time you have in the classroom and how much time, uh, if you're teaching a course that's very focused on covering certain, you know, like chapters or you have to, you know, focus on certain aspects of whatever, like uh, Melissa, you mentioned your course. If you have certain information you have to, to teach, then you may not have time to ask the students to look at five more dime novels. It's much easier now with the digitalization project, absolutely, than when I was teaching them. But I, so I would say that, that probably uh, it's going to really depend on what the course is, what the subject of the course is, and how much time you can spend on any particular aspect of the materials that you have to teach and then, then move on. And so if you, you know, if you have a course that you can just relax and just go through it, you know, at your own pace, no problem. But if you have a course where you have a certain amount of information that you have to cover over the course of a quarter or a semester, you may not be able to ask the students to, you know, you might ask them to do it on their own time and then report back to you. But you may not be able to ask them to do it as part of their curriculum. You know, that actually reminds me of how I originally used the dime novel in, in a course that I taught. And it was Actually, the course was literature and popular culture. And as a matter of fact, this was at NIU. So it's going back uh, about two years ago. 
And so, okay, we were going to be covering several different texts, and this was actually a, a, a unit on West, on the Western. And so we were reading some other works, and so we used, our, I put Seth Jones in, and I, that's what I did, is I, I thought because of time constraints, it is sometimes the case where you think, well, I think we can get a lot out of the first two chapters here, the introduction of the character, his, uh, his man speech mannerisms, the, the introduction of Seth Jones, and then the frontier situation. And then, you know, you ask students, what do you think is going to happen next? Many of them can kind of predict it's going to be a, a story where they, you know, they, there's some uh, Indians that are in the forest at the end of chapter two. So there's ways in which you can uh, uh, just uh, focus on a, a small part of that. And I think it, it is true. Time constraints are always something you're dealing with when you're teaching and your syllabus and some of the other things, some schools, as was mentioned earlier, uh, it, uh, I think Nathaniel was saying that there may be some schools that won't permit you to do it. So let me just throw in one other thing about this. Uh, what Matt was saying is, is it something that you should pair with a, another work of literature or should you um, read several of these? And I think both are, are great approaches. And I would just say to the, to the people participating, try doing both, but certainly the idea of pairing is a good one because I don't think you want to read these in isolation. Certainly the readers of the 19th century didn't do that. They read many of these. And so even if you were reading one sea story by Roger Starbuck, this novelist I mean, if, if you liked it, you're going to read another one and another, and you would start to see patterns. And then just, I would say this semester, the story that I introduced, it was actually, it's a, it's a wailing story, but it's very short. It has a surprise ending. And actually we paired it with uh, this short story Chickamauga by Ambrose Bierce, which also has a kind of twist ending. And so that was the focus. It was partly the topic, but also the technique of creating suspense and then having that twist ending. And I felt that that was a good way to, to, to do pairing. So the pairings don't always have to be topical. They can also be rhetorical and, and there can be other approaches. So I, I, I know that it's a, a long-winded answer, but obvious, and it's also a, a an equivocal one, but yeah, sometimes pairing with master works of literature is a good idea, but then try not to think of these dime novels or even short story uh, in story papers as works that are, live on their own. They should be uh, connected to the, the tradition of these kinds of stories. Can I, can I give a, a quick answer there because I like something that Fred said as well. Uh, the, you know, if it's a serialized dime novel, you could teach a piece of it, right? And in fact, as, as Michael Denning says, that replicates a 19th century reader's experience more than reading the whole thing. I mean, a lot of us grew up reading comic books where you had issue 12 and issue 15, and you had to figure out what happened in the middle. And that's that's part of that reading experience that, that a lot of those people had. So in some ways that's more realistic. And the other thing that I say, just because I think these things are built for that kind of distant reading approach, um, make sure if you're teaching these, you have the students look on the back cover and the list of all the previous issues that came up because you're going to, I mean, certainly like with the Frank Reed novels, I can have them look at that and, and just say, okay, where did this character go in the last two years? If you look at the body, we only need to read this one issue, but if you look at the back, you can kind of see just what a global uh, endeavor that was. You can do the same thing with the crimes in a, in a detective series, but I, I think that that's always worth doing is kind of looking at the, the clues about the other issues in this series uh, in the text. That's all. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just echo what everybody else has said. When I teach um, Italian American immigration and criminality, I, there's one trilogy in the Nick Carter series in 1909. And it's, there are three issues in a row. The first one, they admit they, they talk about Joseph Petrosino being assassinated, the real life assassination. And then there's this uncovering in these three issues. And what's great about that is it, it sort of gives them an overview of a way to think about Italian Americana. But then I can give them, it's not canonical to maybe American literature, but I'll give them Pietro Di Donato's Christ in Concrete, which is certainly one of the great proletariat novels of the United States, where we look at immigration from a different point of view from uh, the construction industry. And so I'll move to other pieces of literature that allow them to constantly refer back and to grow what they've seen in those, that trilogy, but then they can keep going forward and they can, and they can talk to each other. 
So I'm really interested in whether it's close reading or distant reading, I want them to be able to see the conversations that maybe they weren't set up to be conversations, but the conversations that can be had between texts and, and their own intellectual sort of curiosity that can go back and forth. Thank you um, very much. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was just going to say very quickly that I think one of the values of the nickel and dimes website is that you can just have students go and search a subject, right? And so what are the amazing things that you can find if you just search sea fiction or, <laughs> right, um, Abraham Lincoln? Um, any, I mean, there's all kinds of dime novels about particular individuals or historical events. Uh, and so you don't have to know what you want to find. You just go play, right? And so it is this lovely treasure trove um, to, to get in there. And because, you know, these fabulous librarians have done all this work to sort these books for us, um, it's really quite a, a pleasure to just look through the the cover images even, right? And so you can do all kinds of fun things. Um, if you're a his more historian, right? You could look about um, abolitionist texts, right? Uh, see what you can find there and then just let students start to build a um, document collection around a particular theme. You might invite them to use dime novels and other kinds of primary texts um, in a, in a collection. So one thing that I've done in my teaching is um, to have students curate a kind of um, virtual exhibit and dime novels can be part of that, right? And then they might have to have some primary source materials in the way that I think Nancy does for her students, but you can ask students to do this work too, right? Um, so can you find um, newspaper articles or um, material culture objects that might be part of, uh, a theme that, that you can kind of work through in the class and then have students just go out and assemble these things and write exhibit labels and do all kinds of fun things. So the, there's a lot of creative possibilities for teaching with dime novels. Thank you everyone for a great panel. I think uh, with the time we have left, we're gonna move on to Q and A. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Sada, who's been assembling questions and comments, and remind you that if you want to ask a question on mic, just go ahead and raise your hand, and when space opens up, we'll unmute you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for uh, giving us such great suggestions. Uh, we've had a couple of questions uh, put forth in the chat. I do want to go ahead and drop a link in the chat for those who are unsure of how to raise their hand. This is uh, something that includes pictures of what your screen should look like. So again, if you want to comment uh, or ask a question verbally, just raise your hand and we'll unmute you. So the first question that I have for our panelists from the audience is what percentage of all titles ever published do you think that archives actually represent? How many titles do we only know the titles of or the author without having the story? And I think that's as like a rough sense of percentage they're asking. <laughs> that seems like a question for Matt. <laughs> yeah. Matt, Matt, if I could break in, because Matt, Matt might remember, you know, I, when I was doing some research on this particular dime novelist, I, I know of all the works he, I, I, we have a lot of records of what he published. And then there were, at the time I was looking into him, there were some works that we, that I, that we and I discovered, you know, that were in story papers. So I think one of the ways to answer this is to say that and I, I think Matt should chime in on this, but I would, based on what I have found, I think we may never really know the full picture of this inexpensive fiction of the 19th century. Yes, we have a lot of archives. It's an amazing resource that we've got. And there are a lot of these different libraries, but I would like to suggest that I, I, I think we, in our time, we may never have the full picture. So that's one way to say it. And then just uh, finally with this novelist, especially, or this writer, uh, uh, whose name is Roger Starbuck, you, what you can find on, on nickels and dimes would be about a third of his output. 
and, and that includes his dime novels. But uh, of course it is changing as more titles come out. And I mean, a third that I, I, I don't know. So maybe, well, maybe a little more than that. Maybe about 40% of his output is available online. So the first thing I'd say is uh, we may know that something exists, but that doesn't necessarily mean we know where to find it or how to get our hands on it so we can scan it. So kind of the Johansson collection at NIU is somewhat unusual because it was assembled over several decades by um, a bibliographer who then used his personal collection to write his bibliography. Um, so it's fairly comprehensive. Most of the other collections in the US are not quite as comprehensive. So they might have full runs of some series like Tip Top Weekly, but then they'll have huge gaps in others. So that's why really kind of working together and collaborating with each other on these digitization projects is so important because it's unlikely any library will ever have every issue of every dime novel ever published. Um, the other challenge is sometimes these materials, we know that they exist, but they're not publicly available. So they're in private collections and maybe we don't have a budget this year and we can't afford to purchase them. <laughs> so the stuff is out there, uh, just trying to find it is one challenge and then acquiring it is another one sometimes because uh, there might be not very many copies available. Um, the other issue is we may know that a series exists, but it's possible no one has ever seen an example of it. So this is pretty common with uh, uh, LeBlanc's bibliographies, but also sometimes in Johansson. So he says, well, we've seen advertisements for this title or this series, but no one's ever actually held it in their hands. So we might have a list of titles from the advertisements, but no one's ever actually examined them. So that's pretty common as well. Uh, and then there's stuff that is being discovered all the time, things that, no one knew existed until um, Joe sold them a story paper from his collection and you know, a new discovery is made. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think we'll ever uh, know everything that exists and it's gonna take you know, a couple decades at least, if not my entire lifetime to digitize what we have been able to find so far. And I don't know if Damien wants to add anything to that either, but. <laughs> I'm happy to weigh in. Uh, it's certainly an ongoing quest. I, I would just say to put things in perspective, when Matt and I first started talking about this project eight years ago, there was practically nothing online. And now just looking at dimenovels.org, the full text list, we have almost 12,000 things linked from there and there's still more linking to do. So we've made huge progress, uh, but it's still maybe more decades to get through all that is known, and we'll keep finding that which is unknown. Uh, if there's one uh, helpful factor, it's that the dime novel publishers like to recycle a lot. So even though individual issues can be very rare, there's a good chance that the text exists somewhere, maybe in a more common format. So I think we'll be able to recover all the stories more quickly than all the versions of the stories. But there are always going to be those phantoms out there that, that may be lost to the ages or may never have existed in the first place. But that's part of the fun. And I would just like to add that in terms of Don Novel Roundup, I mean, Joe Raynone has been so helpful because he has a spotlight that he could, you know, in each of our issues. And generally, a lot of the, 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 the texts that he comes up with are things that were not previously known about or had you know something that was just a one one of a kind issue and things like that so i would agree with everything that you're saying Damien, and what matt said i mean uh there is just so much out there and you know that also Damien, from my whole thing with the multum and parvo library <laughs> and so it it is what it is you're constant we're constantly finding things and it's wonderful Thank you very much for all of your answers. Um, I did have a gentleman named Peter in here with a hand up, but he seems to have gotten lost. So I hope he returns to us. Um, in the meantime, uh, Felicia Carr, I'm going to give you the ability to unmute. Oh, you're not yet unmuted. Oh, okay, sorry. How about now? Okay, thank you. I just wanted to tie back to something Matt said about 
the collections and what we know about them and relying on the work of the people who did the collecting and those same folks who did the bibliographies, we know that most of the collectors were men. In fact, I can't find an archive where the collection is based on a collection of a female reader. So folks that were reading them when they were young and then started collecting when they became adults, they're, as far as I know, all men. And I haven't seen anything where women's had that same urge to collect the things that they read as young women. So that's kind of an interesting gender take on what we know and what's available, what's been saved, archived, and collected. Um, I visited probably a dozen archives, and I couldn't find any that had been specifically started by female readers. So I think there might be some romances for women that are now might be lost permanently because there wasn't that same collecting impulse. Thanks. And Felicia is right. I mean, Dime Novel Roundup was started by the guys. <laughs> uh, I mean, in 1931, Ralph Cummings, you know, he started in, it was a group of collectors who wanted to trade notes uh, with each other on about their collections and trade the issues and what they found and things like that. And so it, it was a specialized group, which is all the more why I feel very honored to be the first woman editor of Don Mabel Roundup because I think it's great, <laughs> you know, but it was, a, you know, but it doesn't matter in the long run, you know, to me personally, it doesn't matter who started it, it's that it's still around. And it's still there. And, you know, I just want to say there's a little plug for Dime Novel Roundup. We're in our 89th year, guys. We are the next, one of the next longest running publications behind Harper's Weekly. I mean, in, in the top 10 in the United States. And that is so wonderful for a magazine that was started by a group of collectors who just wanted to share their interests. And we're still going strong. And I'm, I'm just, I hope I can get us to uh, 2031. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to give Mr. Joe Renone an opportunity to uh, speak if, if that's desired. Uh, I've seen you waving your hand, so I thought that might be worthy. Oh, you're not yet audible, though you are officially unmuted. Oh, I'm very sorry. Could try putting it in the chat. I could see him a little while ago. Uh, I don't see him now, but I was, I could see him. Uh, I can see Joe, but I can't hear him. And he's, he does have the muted button on my display. I don't know what that's. All right, then I will ask the next question and I'll pull up a troubleshooting guide that might help you, Mr. Anon. Oh. Yeah, I can see him. So the, the next question that we have is, what advice would you give a teacher considering a unit on the dime novel for just beginning? Oh, there's Jill. No, I can't hear you. I mean, I'll answer that question. I think. Thank you, kind. Sure. Um, I think if you're going to teach a dime novel, and say it's in high school or a gen ed class at the college level. I think you first have to find time to read some dime novels and understand what you're getting into. If you're a college professor, you may have some experience in the era or the genre, but if you're a high school teacher, you may have to just do some reading and not maybe just of dime novels, but maybe you do wanna do things like pick up Dime Novel Roundup or other magazines that are gonna help you situate what it is about dime novels. Like Melissa says, what's your goal in teaching this, right? So if you want to introduce them to high school juniors or seniors, what's the goal in doing that, 
I, and I think that's true of everything we teach. We're always assessing and thinking about the goals and the learning outcomes. And dime novels are no different. But I do think it's an opportunity to give students something different that catches them off guard and makes them less guarded and less apt to go, well, this is how I'm supposed to read it. It gives them an opportunity to open up and be a little bit more um, curious. I'm using that word, but I, I think it's true. So thanks, thanks for that question. I agree, and I'll just really quickly say also give them a sense of the authorship and how how these things were produced, right? How many of these things per month some of these writers did under how many pseudonyms? Uh, I think students find that fascinating, and it, it is a testament to uh, to these people's production. And I think also give them a little bit of like what 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 we you saw at the beginning um, with Matt Hill, who took you through the history. And you know, of why they were produced, how they were produced, the five major um, publishers, and and I would also just add one other thing too: start simple. You know, start simple. Um, choose a story. You know, go you know go on to the nickels and dimes, and you know, familiarize yourself with them, uh, the stories if you can, if you have time, and then choose a story that is not so complicated because one of the things about the, and I, I, I failed to mention that when I was, when you asked me about the challenges, one of the other challenges of the dime novel stories is that many of their plots are very convoluted, you know, and very melodramatic and they have umpteen characters. We all know this guys, <laughs> we do. They have umpteen characters for which everybody's trying to keep up with, okay, where did I see, where did I read about this one? Because especially the ones that were serialized because they were serialized over a period of time in the story papers. So there was always a cliffhanger and they went to the next week or the next issue. And you had to remember who all of these, this legion of characters were um, in order to, so I would say choose a story that is a little bit more on the simplistic side, if you can find one that has fewer characters, a reasonable plot, <laughs> if there is such a thing in a dime novel. And, you know, I mean, because obviously they were written for melodramatic purposes, but, but at least choose one, and, you know, and go by recommendations, seek out others who have already taught them, you know, like Melissa or other people, seek them out and say, okay, what did you find was really worthy of teaching in this particular one? And, you know, and, and that's to me, I think is the best way to start is to, you know, go to, you know, Nathaniel or Fred or, or anybody, any one of us or others who teach, who have taught them and ask us, you know, what, what, it, What's, what's a good story? I wouldn't start out with Bill Warren's Who Was Guilty? I mean, it's a story, of, it's a detective fiction story, but there are 10 characters who could be the culprit. And the students who have, you know, in an advanced course when I taught it, no problem. In a high school course, no, I don't think it would be that effective. And I think the students would be very confused. So try to start out simple and then graduate yourself up to more complex um, texts. I just add that um, these are texts that people read for fun, mm -hmm. right? And so emphasize the fun part of these stories. <laughs> this is entertainment, right? So what did people find entertaining about these stories? Um, they may not entertain us in the same way. And so we have to start with that question, right? Which, which is that these, these, I think, are primarily fun stories in the 19th century. And emphasizing the fun, I think, is, is key. I, I think I, well, I should chime in on that just briefly because, yeah, there's a lot of humor in these stories. And some of that humor relies on language, um, joke, I mean, puns and things like this. So one just let, last thing to say about those who are starting this. As you can probably imagine, there is a lot of preparation that does go into doing a dime novel in a unit or creating a unit itself about the dime novel, because we, there's not a lot of apparatus surrounding these. I, I, wait a minute. There is nickels and dimes, this session. Of course, there's a lot of scholarship, dime novel roundup. But if you're just beginning and you have a text and you think this is pretty interesting, you, you have to put in the work to uh, give some uh, maybe some pre-reading activities to the students and also um, finesse what you're going to be reading about. And especially if you've got jargon or if there are some jokes, I just think that, you know, there, there are different theories on, you know, how when you're teaching reading or whatever, should you introduce vocabulary before you read or just let the students encounter vocabulary as they read? 
And I think from my experience, this is one of those cases where it doesn't hurt to pre-teach a little bit of what you might encounter in the text. Uh, get ready for that so that students don't, uh, some of them who might not have experience with older texts, don't get discouraged by not understanding or not being familiar with situation or, or language. I agree. Thank you all very much. Uh, we're definitely down to the past the wire uh, <laughs> <laughs> because of our interesting subject. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and call for final questions or brief comments. Um, and uh, first, do you want to give another try, Joe? Oh dear, I'm so sorry. If there is anything that you'd like to say, we will all be able to see the chat as well. Uh, so there's at least that. We can try again. Well, hopefully we'll get to see you tomorrow. Uh, while we're waiting on very last comments, I'll go ahead and say that I'll be sticking around for a little while for any of the people who are using the Moodle in order to uh, participate in the teaching activities and earn continuing education credits. So if anyone needs any assistance in understanding that system, I'll be here to help you uh, get through at least the sign up and where information is. I'll give it one more minute if our panelists permit it. All right, I'm not seeing anyone desperately typing. So. <laughs> so I think I get the honor of saying thank you very much. Um, I bet Matt would like to close us out though. Yes, thanks everyone for coming and remember that we're doing this again tomorrow night at the same time. So there will be less videos to watch which might be a mercy. Um, and we'll have two panel discussions, one on uh, representation and identity and the other on genre. Uh, and we're hoping also to have Marlena and Damien and I will give some pitches about where to publish and um, present dime novel research. So please join us again tomorrow, but otherwise, thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. everyone. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow. Good night. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Good night. I'll give us just a moment more for any of the teachers that are wanting to see the Moodle. Um, and I don't know if Felicia is still in here, but uh, the chat is saved, or it should be as part of the recording. All right, is there anybody left here who is needing to see the Moodle, get access to the Moodle, or want a tour of how to use it? You can raise a hand or put an item in the chat. Also, hi, Max. I didn't realize you were in here. All right. Um, I don't think anyone has said yes they would like any assistance with that part so i'll go ahead and say good night and i'm always available if that needs happen in the future see you tomorrow <laughs>